Hey, it's Jane here. It's the beginning of June and I don't know if you can hear that weather coming down on the roof, but it's absolutely bucketing down. So I thought it'd be a good chance to get in the shed, have a little chat and answer some of your questions. Okay. tell you what the weather gods <laughs> they must have seen me in the shorts last week and they've decided they don't want any more of that because the last few days it has bucketed down so what better opportunity is there than to have a little catch up in the shed um keep nice and dry but uh so what i'm going to do today is something slightly different because i know what i'm like and i know it'll be a big talking video that you know you'll lose the will to finish your cup of tea 10 minutes in so what i'm going to do um there's basically two quite clear parts to it the first part i am going to answer some questions knowing it was going to be rainy i'll put your background in here knowing it was going to be really rainy today and i wanted to get a video out um i asked on the facebook group if anyone had any questions about the allotment for me and quite a group of you did so first half of the video the first part if you like i'm going to answer or attempt to answer those questions as succinctly as i possibly can which it won't be <laughs> so that'll be part one okay and then i'll then do part two which is where i'm gonna have a little a little bit of a heart to heart so if you only want to see the questions you know feel free to when it comes to part two turn off if you don't want to hear the questions and answers you might just want to go and see what i'm moaning about in the second bit but uh yeah it'll make sense hopefully in the end anyway enjoy so i've got my phone with me today it's on about eight can you hear the ice cream man i'd love an ice cream I don't know how you can be socially distant from the ice cream man though unless he hands it out on a sort of I don't know a telescopic rod I don't know anyway um I've got my phone which has got all the questions on and it's on about eight percent charge but <laughs> I'm gonna do my best if I can't answer the question I'm just gonna own up and say I can't answer it but I'm gonna do my best to see what you said and and give you my opinion on what what i would do in that situation so on again now let's have a look you know what i've got the shed door open here so i will keep glancing out we're getting these really really heavy almost thundery showers but when the rain stops it's so peaceful it's beautiful and it amplifies the bird song and you can't hear it well i'm sure you can't hear it from up there but i can hear it and that's nice okay question number one just sing amongst yourselves while i'm looking for it <laughs> groups here we go question number one says okay from alison hillman hi alison this says do you feed your crops in the outside beds for example the beans etc if so with what okay the outside the, the beans in particular get extra special treatment i'll come to that in a second but most of our outside beds and with that I'm, i take it you mean not necessarily the the edged beds but the rotational beds at the top we've got the did have four we've got three now it's got the polytunnel um they have all had quite a liberal addition of really really well rotted manure if you see that um the intro to the channel it's got mike and i hiking along well it's got me i think going up the compost bay, bay at the back with a wheelbarrow full of manure and at the very end it's got a standing in front of a pile of manure so high we had that delivered oh last summer it's rotted so well and the thing is when it rots down it goes to almost nothing but that has been 
absolutely brilliant for putting on the beds. It's so well rotted. It um, It's added structure to the soil. I'm saying all this and then I'm complaining about the soil being like concrete, but it's adding food, it's adding all sorts of goodness to the soil. So if you can get hold of any well rotted compost, brilliant. We need to put more on, we need to have another load delivered and wait till next year. It needs constantly building up till it's of a decent standard. Um, but the other thing we do, we do that sort of, I would say, early mid-spring. And then the other thing we do is just about every month or so, toss a little bit of either fish blood and bone or calcified seaweed where we've planted crops. So, you know, it's not like there's a regimented thing of we must feed this with such and such at such and such a time. If we've got crops in, we make sure they get fed every four to six weeks with a handful sprinkling of usually the pellets, chicken pellets as well we use. We're really not stuck to one particular thing. Um, chicken pellets, fish blood and bone, calcified seaweeds, whatever we can get our hand on, hands on which is going to add some nutrients to the soil. The beans however do get extra special treatment um, because they are such hungry growers and hungry feeders. Can you be a hungry feeder? My beans are. That we dug trenches for them and filled that bit of manure at the bottom but then comfrey kitchen scraps um the kale before it went to seed i have mentioned it before anything that's going to rot down and again add uh, structure and nutrients to the soil so they've got that extra little bit of moisture retentive materials in there as well if that makes sense so anything we can get our hands on really we're not strict with any one thing or another you know it's sort of uh just like us really we take it as we find it we go along if um, the calcified seaweeds on offer at the garden center that comes out you know if we've got any fish blood and bone left that comes out to answer your question anything really that you can put on your soil to enrich it is worth it old leaves grass clippings the ice cream man again anything like that put it on okay i hope that's answered that alison i told myself i was going to give myself a minute of question it's not going to work is it okay then brian hi brian brian brown over in new jersey new jersey brian have you ever used homemade bug repellents i just saw today about making thyme tea spray that i want to use on um on his plants i think he wants to use them on his squash it's meant to repel squash bugs I've never used anything like that, Brian. We have used um, the washing up liquid in water, so soapy water. But in recent times, I've read quite a few articles that say that can be really quite damaging to your crop. And it doesn't just kill the bad boys, it kills the good predators, the good boys as well. So uh, we're really, really going to have to think twice about that. I am considering using neem oil which is different again but I've never actually tried using herbs for an oil we've used garlic spray that works quite well so literally just a little bit of garlic a little bit of oil a bit like a salad dressing diluted with water and uh, that helps to repel oh all sorts of things um, the smell puts a lot of insects off but it, it is actually quite good on black fly so I would try, especially this time of year, on your broad beans where black fly are just voraciously heading for the lovely lush new growth. Try a garlic spray, try that. But I like the idea of the thyme tea spray, Brian. That, um, that's nice because I've learned something there. I didn't know you could do that. So that's something to look into. If I can use herbs in a different way to help the garden, what better? So Paul Savadon has said, do you film outside in the rain? Yes, Paul, I do. I'm not quite, <laughs> I'm not quite as nice as all that. But my problem, when it's bucketing down with rain, my camera that I'm pointing at now, which of course you can't see, it's like quite a sizable camcorder, I suppose is what it is. It's not just your phone that you can pick up and cover or a nice little GoPro or anything like that. It's a bulky camera and it gets wet so other than you probably can get little umbrellas for them I don't know but once that gets water on the screen you don't realize until you take it home and you're mid-edit and you're wondering why you know why you've got watermarks running down the screen and also it's a bit too valuable to get wet so 
that's my excuse I'm sticking to that one I'm going over that one Paul but thank you <laughs> I am quite hardy I am uh, next one asparagus this is from Christy who says asparagus maintenance please what do I do after the second year how do I know how long I can pick for do they need fertilizer okay Christy what we've done this is our second year with the asparagus now apparently you can start picking in the second year um, as long as you only pick a little bit because the main thing is this is why you leave them the first year this is if you've planted crowns not by seed if you've planted crowns which is what we did first year crowns planted them left them for the first year this second year we've left them as well because any goodness that can go back down into the crowns is good so much as we would have loved to have picked one or two spears and we could probably have got away with it we've resisted so far and so the third year by next year we are going to be able to start harvesting that and when you think in the grand scheme of things it seems like a long time to wait but actually we've had two seasons with that now and now I'm really looking forward to the third season and the beautiful asparagus we can have and it's going to last if it's a well-maintained asparagus patch that's going to last about 15 20 years so it's worth if you can just really holding back for that first year or two don't do what I did for oh that's my mic don't do what I did for a long time which was oh I'm not going to bother planting that it takes too long to come up time soon flies by um and yeah soon you'll be picking your own asparagus and we had some off the neighbour this year it's absolutely delicious um what I would say is in the late autumn put your ferns down because once your once your asparagus has been and gone and left those beautiful beautiful ferns which are actually really nice and little posies um they'll die back cut them down and give it a really good mulch again this time okay you could feed with the pellets like i was talking about before but what it really wants is a good mulch of, of manure if you can get some or some sort of feed so seaweed or comfrey or something like that which i know is hard to come by in the autumn but we're talking at autumn early spring so that dormant period um pile leaves on top of it pile grass clippings on top of it think about those crowns as you're protecting those crowns over the winter and hopefully anything you put on top will in that time get um, taken down into the soil and enrich your soil it's all about enriching the soil it's not about enriching your plants the way the plants do well is if your soil's good if your soil's no good your plants are going to show it you know so it's all about feeding the soil okay so yeah so it's actually good hope that's good Christy um da -da -da, I'm worried about this going off now right Julie Neary how do I know when to pick garlic started off in modules and planted in the ground in February she also asks if we feed our onions with anything I'm going to do this backwards and have a try growing butternut squash vertically right I'm starting with the butternut squash no I haven't tried growing squash vertically I know a lot of people do Vivi has got squash cathedrals that she builds out of uh, big bits of wood, big branches which are incredible if you go and see Cliff over at Castle Hill Gardens he grows his squash vertically clearly to grow your squash vertically you've got to have a vining squash so something that's going to spread and wrap around and sort of support itself to an extent obviously you're going to have to help it on the way uh, it's no good for example if you've got a courgette that's not going to climb anywhere so make sure uh, a butternut squash is vining so you can grow it vertically I haven't tried it if you try it let me know if anyone else has tried it answer in the comments and uh, it might be an idea to, to let us know how you actually support the squash you know like with melons you see like little melon hammocks don't you um, so yeah let us know do you, do you have butternut squash hammocks <laughs> because of the weight of them you sort of feel well how are they going to stay in the air I don't know I don't know let us know so that's a good one onions feeding onions same again Julie just sprinkle every now and then try and make sure your soil is fairly rich before you put it in um, and well turned over but the garlic when to pick your garlic right if it wasn't raining this would have been a perfect time to go outside and show you because I've got three lots of garlic that it was all planted last 
October, mind you, but it's the same principle. I've got two different sorts of garlic. I've got hard neck at one end, soft neck at the other, and I've got elephant garlic in the middle. Well, of course, they've all grown at different rates and I'm desperate to get it all up so I can get my dwarf beans in. But looking back, I harvested my garlic last year on the 16th of June. So I'm thinking, OK, that's a job for next weekend. I think the old adage is you plant it on the shortest day and crop it on the longest day. Is that right? Or is that new potatoes? I don't know. I'm sure someone will tell me. I think it might be new potatoes. But anyway, you crop it sort of mid-June, you know, round about there. If you've planted in February, it might be taking a, a bit longer. But how you can tell is quite easy. Here's one I made earlier. <laughs> <laughs> look at that look at this poor little soul now what worries me is I pulled this up last week because you can see how yellow those can you see can you see look at how yellow those leaves are okay and it had flopped over like that once that's flopped over that means that that bit is starting to seal up so that bulb is not going to get any bigger. And the reason it seals up is it's gonna protect itself so that, oh, the sun's out now, so that it will preserve really, really well. So it's got this really, really nice, tight paper, little bag, really, that seals itself, does it all for you. What I would say, though, is I wouldn't usually let the leaves get that yellow. I would say maybe 75, 50, 75% of the leaves, once they've started to die back, um, yeah, start doing it then. Each one of these leaves, if you imagine, if you think of it more like an onion, each ring of an onion has got the leaf coming up at the top. Does that make sense? So each one of these is going to provide a little paper thing for each clove. I don't think that makes sense. I know what I mean. So, as that goes to paper, that means that this end is then going to wrap around the clove and start tightening. If you leave it for too long, what can happen is it can start to split and your cloves will split away from each other at the top instead of being in that lovely little tight bag. If they do split, don't worry about it. You can still use them, but they won't store as well. Where was I? But the leaves, yeah. If yours are looking a bit like that, Julie, if they're flopping over, if your leaves are say 50 to 75% yellow, it's dying back. Okay, pick it then. Don't worry if some of your leaves are still green. Um, mine have probably gone too far. I'm hoping now with all this wet weather, they're not gonna get mold or anything. But also, these did have rust on. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about it too much. Uh, it rarely affects the bulb, or in my experience, it rarely affects the bulb. Um, as long as you put some that somewhere cool and dry, to dry out, upside down preferably, um, it should be okay. The other thing I was gonna say, don't be tempted, same with onions, to make it look pretty when you pull it up. Knock the odd bit of mud off, you can do that, but don't go start taking the layers off until they've completely, completely dried and then they'll just wipe off on their own anyway. I know one year I had a really good onion harvest, not last year, I think it might have been my first year growing them, and um, I spent ages after harvesting them taking the outer layer of skin off and they looked absolutely beautiful. They were like shiny, glowing, golden chestnuts really beautiful but i shouldn't have done because that outside layer was helping the preserving the, the the preservation of the onion so i was taking that off so limiting his shelf life if you like that was another very long-winded reply wasn't it julie if your your garlic are still sitting there like that fine if they're doing that think about taking them up okay get them immediately in a cool dry place talking too much I'll talk about talking too much in a minute. Okay, uh, other than eat it, Suzanne, Suzanne, sorry, Suzanne Marburg, other than eating them fresh off the plant, what's your favorite tomato recipe? I'm gonna tell you. Oh, I've got two. Okay, I've got, the, this is what's been keeping me awake last night. 
tomatoes, beefsteak tomatoes, sliced, feta cheese, basil, tiny bit of dressing. Oh, oh, that is the best. However, it's not quite the best. Well, it sort of is the best. It's like equal, it depends what day it is. The other way is a piece of plain white bread. None of you seeded malarkey, which I usually have. White bread, lightly toasted, sliced tomatoes. Again, if you can get the beautifully flavoured beefsteak ones, Amish paste are perfect sliced tomatoes, tiny bit of olive oil on top, tiny bit of cheese if you've got some, if not, don't matter, a little bit of black pepper under the grill to warm it through. Oh my goodness, that, that is absolutely mouth-watering and it's so, so simple. Toast, tomatoes, oil and pepper, cheese if you've got some, under the grill best. That was quick, Julie. You can tell I really like that. Okay, not Julie, Suzanne, sorry. All right, okay, I'm still on charge. I'm still on charge. Nick, hello, Nick. Nick Johnson says, what types of fruit do you grow and what tips do you have to prevent them from being eaten by pests? Okay, we grow. Are you ready? Black currants, red currants, blackberries, tayberries, strawberries, raspberries, autumn and su summer fruiting, blueberries, rhubarb, which is really a vegetable, but we count it. You could say tomatoes because that's really a fruit. But yeah, so all the berries really. Anything else we grow? And I've got to say, we're really looking forward to a good harvest this year because last year was sort of their first year, didn't do so well. We concentrated more on them building up their energy. Um, but as far as pests are concerned, as I said before, the, the soapy spray, if there's like a terrible, terrible infestation, we haven't had any so far, touch wood, any infestations of green flag. I'm saying that we have. If a couple of weeks ago I showed the apple tree, the central apple, and all the um, new leaves were wrinkled up, and that was green fly. So what we did was, it, was, it the, the plant was obviously under stress because it had been so, so hot. We gave it four or five buckets of water and a good feed. And before we knew it, the, the plant had recovered and the next time we looked, we didn't put anything on the leaves at all, but the next time we looked, there were loads of ladybirds. And so really the ladybirds came in and did the job for us. And as far as I know, they're munching up there now. Um, so yeah, it's about making sure, again, making sure that your soil's healthy, your plant's healthy, and then hopefully they won't get attacked because a green fly will spot a sickly plant and head straight for it. Um, but yeah, that's made me think actually, Nick. So it's not just the berries, we've got apples, pears, damsons, plums, cooking apples as well at the top end of the plot. Um, but yeah, how I would do it at the moment, I would use the soapy spray if necessary. Other than that, we don't tend to cover anything other than the strawberries and that's the way we would try and stop pests getting at them. A few hoops, some Enviromesh just before they start fruiting, so around about now really. Um, and hopefully, you know, yeah, the slugs are going to have some, the birds might have the odd peck, but hopefully there'll be enough for us as well. Raspberries just get on with their own thing. Gooseberries tend not to get attacked as with the currants because um, they're quite spiky. So yeah, we don't use, there's not a proprietary thing that we use. What do you use? Let me know, comments below. What do you use? Preferably organic? And let me know of any sort of tried and tested things. I bet Brian will know of a herbal tea. Okay, I hope that answered that, Nick. Okay, Joanne, what made you leave your last allotment and choose your new one? Joanne, this is a big one. Now, I'll put a link to when we first got this allotment, either up here somewhere or down below, if I remember. Um, but basically it was the size and I've said before, and I'm sorry if you've heard me say this before, but to put it in a nutshell, basically, I absolutely loved our old allotment, but we had explored and utilised every single corner of it. It was only like half the size. It's council size allotment and half of that. So half a council size allotment, if you get me. Um, and, and we'd use it. There was nothing else we could do. 
Um, and in fact, as we've got here, actually, the neighbour offered us space to grow our squash in their plot because we'd run out of space. So when we came along here, initially we were going to keep hold of the two and just use the other one for fruit. But of course that doesn't, never pans out. It was, it was as if, when you hear about people buying a house and they walk into it and they feel like it's home and they know that's the house of them, whatever state it's in. And I mean, I could talk to you about when we bought our house, absolutely falling down, but we loved it. And it was a bit like that with this. It was just a bit of a love at first sight thing, but on a practical level, it was the space. We knew we'd have a lot of scope here for years to come to expand on different things and be able to, um, yeah, to try out different experiments and things like that. I mean, we're still in the very early days here. This is only our second summer, or is it our third? You know, we're only just starting to see the benefits of all the hard work we've put in. But yeah, yeah. So there was that initial feeling of this is it. This is where we should be. Plus the practical size. It's, you know, the size of it. So yeah, I hope that comes across. Should do. But yeah, it's, um, it was hard leaving the other one because I did absolutely love it. It was my baby. Uh, right, 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 right. Doing well so far. Erica! Hello Erica! Erica Galpin! Lovely Erica from Erica's Little Welsh Garden. What is the first vegetable you remember growing and how old were you? Radish and I was eight and I'll tell you how I remember. We'd moved house and mum and dad got a tiny, well I'm saying tiny little greenhouse, it was a very small greenhouse, proper glass, not like one of these poly ones, I don't think they had them those days, and <laughs> back in Victorian times. Um, and I remember I didn't know anybody in this new place, we were 100 and odd miles away from where we had been living, so I was quite a lonely and a very shy youngster. And so mum had started growing tomatoes in the greenhouse and I had always liked cucumber and radish but it being the early 70s cucumber and radish in my house was seen as completely exotic a salad was just tomatoes and lettuce and limp lettuce at that okay sorry mum and dad it's the truth um and so whenever i got the chance if ever we went to i remember my lovely lovely auntie queenie I've, i'm sure i've said this before if we went to their house, she knew I loved radish, she knew I loved cucumber. And even if we, she'd made us a roast dinner, she would always give us at me a dish of sliced cucumber. There's been a whole cucumber in there and it was just magical, I loved it. But also radish. Radish was seen as an exotic thing. Um, and so I was given a packet and before I moved on to cucumbers, I remember planting them. And of course it's, it's pretty much instant gratification with it isn't it it's sort of like oh my goodness i put that seed in there a couple of weeks ago now i can eat it you know so um yeah so it's about eight and uh yeah persuaded mum to she must have grown it from seed i don't know where else she would have got it from in the early 70s garden centers aren't aren't the same now as they were then i don't know if there were any anyway she got a cucumber plant from somewhere and uh i remember picking and eating those cucumbers and they were the best absolute best but radish was the actual first one yeah yeah what were your first fruit and veg what were you what was the first thing you remember actually growing that you could eat okay comments below comments below it's a big comments below one this one okay <laughs> i promise you we're coming to the end michelle hello michelle she says, what is your motivation for growing food? Abundance, self-sufficiency, nutrition, enjoyment, etc. And what motivates you when you get tired or face garden failures? <coughs> I think abundance, I think we all see abundance in different ways. I see abundant as completely overwhelmed and overjoyed with fruit and veg coming in everywhere. We haven't, we're not at that stage yet, um, but we're quite rich in what we've got. Um, Self-sufficiency, it's not something I started off wanting to do when we got our first allotment. It was just about growing the odd thing um, and having space because we only had a tiny garden at home, having space to grow things I wanted to grow. But I think the main thing, if I'm honest, I am moving towards, we'll never be completely self-sufficient because this isn't our job. Do you know what I mean? It's not our full-time job it's not our ground it's an allotment we rent it from someone um 
but I am moving more towards being, have stu ha being able to have stuff to go take us through the winter, which is why we've got Lord knows how many tomato plants out there at the minute. And people keep saying, what on earth are you going to do with them all? I don't know. I'm just going <laughs> to just going to curse them all in September, October time when I'm in the kitchen up to here in tomatoes, touch wood, um, making them into sauces and things like that. But having, having had a taste of that over the last couple of years where we are dipping into our summer stock in November, December, January, I had some courgette soup last week from courgettes from last year. Courgette and garlic soup. It was absolutely delicious. And I love that. So we are moving more towards growing the majority of our own food. Um, exercise, absolutely. I mean, just walking down the lane to get here is it's quite it's quite a long lane. You don't realise you're doing it. It's the best form of exercise. You're out in the fresh air. You feel so, so good afterwards. Um, but also the taste, the flavour. Once you've grown your own food, and then you have to taste the stuff that you buy in the shops unless you're paying over the odds for organic stuff or you know locally grown or you do have to pay over the odds for that taste whereas if you do grow your own you know how good it tastes i mean i'm preaching to the converted here you know i mean the one i always use is, is the tomato your first hand-baked tomato oh my goodness me you can't get flavors like that in the shop so really yeah i could go down to aldi other supermarkets are available and get you know I think a carrots for 45 pence but they won't be as sweet or as satisfying as the ones you grow yourself so so a little bit of all the things you mentioned Michelle which is <coughs> it's just really useful to you, isn't it? but it'd be interesting to know how many of you do it for one thing or another I think for me it's very holistic everything's wrapped up into one feel good factor I think that, that's what I'd call it. You know you're doing good, you know you're doing yourself good. If you're doing it organically, you're doing the earth good. You're giving your plants a happy life and then you chop them down and eat them. Good. Okay, and then, <laughs> this is the last one. I promise you, I, I, honestly, I've gone over a minute per question, haven't I? This is Rue. Now, Rue, I was awake at five o'clock this morning and I saw this question and I couldn't get back to sleep then until about seven o'clock. I should have just got up, but um, it's had my mind racing over and over. Rue asks, Rue over at Rue's Life, lovely channel, go and say hi. If you were a fruit or a vegetable, which one would you be? Well, let's book it in down again now thing that came to mind and I know I'm not giving any definitive answers here at all that's what I'm like first thing that came to mind was a spaghetti squash because whereas it might look sort of reasonably well contained on the outside inside all those bits those random bits of spaghetti style squash going all over the place so I'm a little bit like that with my brain um but then I did think my my maiden name isn't that a funny term? Maiden. When I was a maiden, my surname was Berry. So I grew up, you can imagine the taunts and the comments. Uh, one of the most famous, you know, all the, the ones I got all the time. Have you got a brother called Bill? Bill Berry. Oh, you know, okay, okay. But then you'd have people saying things like, have you got a cousin called Straw? Or, you know, it just, <laughs> is your mum called Rass? It didn't make any sense, but these people thought it was very, very funny. But it didn't make me think, well, maybe I'm a berry because I was a berry. And uh, I thought maybe a strawberry because I'm okay. I come out when the weather's warm, but I've got seeds on the outside, which really annoy some people. <laughs> I've overthought that question so much, Rue, since five o'clock this morning. And then, and then I said to Mike, I thought, right, I'll put it to Mike because he might be able to um, just, you know, put me, clear my head of it really and give me a fresh outlook. And so I, I said the same to him, I said, Mike, if I was a fruit or vegetable, what would it be? <laughs> and without even taking a breath, Mike just said, a plum. So when asked, <laughs> when asked 
that's why is that because you're round and shiny okay what can you say what can you say anyway he's a right old walnut so there we go so <laughs> think have a little think yourself how would you describe yourself and why and why you know I mean strawberry is not even my favorite berry but um yeah yeah I think I'd be quite, something quite okay you know not gonna be a Jerusalem artichoke or anything like that that wouldn't be good but uh, <laughs> let me know what you think in the comments below oh dear too much time too much navel gazing at the moment um yeah yeah thank you so much for those i had real fun actually going through them and trying to think even though it meant a sleepless night last night trying to sort of have a because it's quite challenging you sort of think okay have i got a definitive answer do i do this and then suddenly realizing that no i haven't i do things all sorts of different ways i am very eclectic it's the sort of person i am i mean look at the shed you know here i am in tetanus corner <laughs> these things there is some rhyme and reason to it you know but um yeah anyway anyway right so thank you so much for that again facebook group i, I know i say it all the time get over there we do have some fun it, it it really is good if you're on facebook i understand why people aren't if you're not so uh, yeah.